Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined with a fabulous guest. Her name is Christine Nikolic, and we met on January 1st, 2012. So almost so nine years ago, and we were working together at The Late Show with David Letterman. So we can talk more about that later, that experience, because there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> but uh, can you first just like introduce yourself and tell me where you're from, what you do? Sure. Um, I'm Christine Nikolic. I am from the suburbs of Chicago. The suburb was called Barrington. Um, I am currently living in Chicago now, and I currently am a digital media producer at a nonprofit called Mercy Home for Boys and Girls. Cool. What is a uh... A digital media producer, you said? Yeah, I kind of <laughs> made up the title, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, one time I made myself the marketing director just so I could have that on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was a, I started as a digital marketing coordinator and um, I, I'm their like main video person and I do all the social media and I was like, digital marketing coordinator doesn't sound like I do any of those things, so... Uh-huh. This summer, I asked my boss if I could change my title, and he said, sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> Begrudgingly. So what, yeah. what do you do? What does a, a digital media producer do? So yeah, I run all of our social media accounts. We have, I think, around 10. Um, so yeah, I created the TikTok for Mercy Home. Um, oh. We have an Instagram. We have a facility dog called Pongo, and I run his Instagram, so I'm his publicist. <laughs> Um, we also have, um, our CEO, father, Scott, he has like his own LinkedIn and Facebook and I run that. Um, so yeah, I run all of the social, um, but then I also find like all the photos and videos that we use for our like website. So I do a lot of like the back end creative work and then I do all of the video stuff. Um, I also have a podcast with Mercy Home called, um, around our home. And then we also have a Sunday mass and Mercy Home podcast that I run too. So a lot of moving parts, but then I also help with like emails and, um, we have a, <laughs> we have like a store called Mercy Boku resale boutique. So I help with their website. We have like a lot of moving parts with Mercy Home. So I That's do a, great a lot name. of things. <laughs> Yeah, merci Boku. <laughs> <laughs> We're French. <laughs> so, we fancy. Yeah. So, um, so like, tell me a little bit, um, what did you study in college? What did you do after you graduated? And what kind of got you to where you are now? So I went to Ball State University, Chirp Chirp. Muncie. Muncie. <laughs> um, and I studied tel- telecommunications production. And then I was a digital media minor. Um, so I basically studied like all of the inner workings of creating movie magic, um, from like audio production to editing to video production, all that stuff. And then digital media minor was like social media stuff. Um, my first job was at a newspaper. I was a videographer. Um, so I did like a lot of local commercials. I filmed a lot of like local sports. Um, and I did that for a year and I got laid off. Um, cause it was like a really small newspaper and there was like six of us that were working there as videographers. They didn't meet that many people. And then I luckily got another job within like a week. Um, it was a friend of my mom's from college. Um, he knew the head of this company and it was a company called evidence video. And this was like my craziest job, <laughs> um, where I filmed people that got in horrific accidents And that was used in court cases. So I filmed like someone that was dying at one point, like this woman that had cancer who had like a huge tumor to the point where she looked like she was nine months pregnant, but then also looked like she was deathly ill because she was like 90 pounds, but had like a huge tumor. And I had to film her like dying in one room and then her crying baby in the other room. Like that's the kind of stuff I did every day. Um, and I was filming those and editing those. And it, I did that for two years and it got very depressing. Sure, yeah. Um, but it was a really awesome learning experience. Um, but yeah, but I just, I had to leave that job. Um, but that's also why I started doing like improv and stuff, which isn't career-wise, but that's helped me with a lot of things in general career-wise. Um, but yeah, my next job was I did depositions as a videographer. Um, I did that for a couple of years. And then I did a complete career shift Um And I thought this was going to be my lifetime career where I um, worked at a place called White House Post as a 
like assistant basically. And, um, it's an advertising company in Chicago. And my um, goal was to be a producer with them, but it's really hard to move up in a company like that. Just, there's a lot of people that are competing for the producer and editor jobs. And I just didn't really see a future in sight with them. And, um, Mercy Home ended up reaching out to me because I had interviewed with them before White House and it just seemed like a really good opportunity and really good, like career shift. So that's how I ended up at Mercy Home. We cool. had a lot of like freelance stuff with them. Like I did real world for a hot sec. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when they were in Chicago, I forget what year that was, maybe like 2011, 2012. No. Is there like a closed set or is it just like they're running around Chicago and you're like man on the street style filming them? It was a closed set. They were in West Loop. Um, mm. So they had a house and mm. um, like the production team was in the basement. But I was just like pa I was like driving them around uh, drunken nights, like home from the bars and stuff. <laughs> you're like, Hollywood, here I come. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was a weird experience, but it was That's- fun. That's kind of what I tell people about my time at Letterman was like a whole lot of making copies and ordering, ordering sushi for the writers. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the best part of the real world, world experience was doing like the setup of the house. Like I helped with like planting the plants outside and like fixing the pillows and making all the beds. It was just weird seeing it empty before all of the like douchey people came in. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I do. This is my legacy. This is my life's work. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So when when you were like in school, when you were at Ball State, was it the school? Was it the Letterman school at that point? It was. Yeah. Well, Letterman went there. So yeah. um, Yeah. yeah. So was the, was the dream to work on big Hollywood productions or what were you thinking you would do when you were like 17, 18, 19, that kind of thing? Yeah. My dream was always to move to LA and be a director um, I did like, I filmed f- funny movies in high school and all that stuff. And I thought that that was gonna make me become the biggest star <laughs> in the world. But here I am today. <laughs> you're, you're, you're successful in my eyes. <laughs> Thanks. It's something we talk about a lot on the pod is really what is success, you know? That's true. Um, so, but it, but LA maybe could be on the table post COVID. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's always moving out west is always in my the back of my mind for sure yeah yeah um so let's see we actually talked about kind of the breaks um let's see for young people starting out and they want to get into film or media do you do you feel like college is the best route or is it getting some experience is it building a reel i actually just edited my first reel last year really yeah i was 29 when i edited my first reel and i was like i don't know why i waited so long but uh, i don't know i hadn't been doing just video because i went i was in like I think my first title was associate director of multimedia communications. That sounds really official. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's just like a lot of words that just like this sounds, you know, like a camera guy. So, um, uh, so for you, like, are there any things you would have changed? Any things you would have done faster? Is there any stuff you would have gotten rid of and not done if you could do it again? Um, I mean, I loved college. I thought it was such a fun time but I don't know if you need it in order to do what um what I dream of doing um like I mean I think it's all about who you know if you want to work in the movies and honestly at this point working on a movie set sounds awful (laughs) to me just because like the hours like I feel like I, I witnessed that when I was working on real world, it was like 12 hour days. I was making $8 an hour. And I was just like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> um, I mean, I think if I could eventually like write and direct my own movie, that'd be awesome. But thinking about like grinding, you just have to start from the ground up, no matter what age you are in order to get like to the top in the film industry. So I think if you're looking to be in the film industry, you don't have to go to school. It's just about who you know. It's about mm. starting from the bottom and working your way up. I think school helps with a lot of jobs that I've done because a lot of like more corporate jobs require a college degree, but I don't think the film industry does necessarily. Um, 
did you consciously choose jobs that are kind of like rewarding and are helping individual people and giving back? Because it seems like every job you've had has been something that you're directly working with people in need and helping them. Was that a conscious effort? It was not. Um, and I feel like I didn't ask, answer your last question entirely about like what I would do differently. Um, I think if I wanted to, I think I, I do regret not grinding and staying out in New York after Letterman. I do regret not immediately moving to like LA and just trying it. I was not that I was scared, but my parents have had like a very stable career trajectory where they like had a job after college, got married, had kids kind of a thing. And so I feel like whenever I asked them for advice, they were like, just move home and get a steady job and blah, 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 pay your bills. <laughs> but like, I think in order to be in the film industry, you do have to like grind and struggle. And I've never struggled <laughs> to the point where I'm like eating beans every night. Um, but I do think that subconsciously I've loved like being able to help people with every job. And it's helped me learn a lot. And it's made me realize that I love the nonprofit industry. And this is now my dream job is to be like a video director of a nonprofit eventually, I think would be like my goal or to like create a social media platform, not platform, but like a social media presence for like a smaller nonprofit or something like that. And I, I have enjoyed all my jobs to a degree. Um, it's emotionally taxing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I think though you actually maybe stumbled into something that a lot of videographers realize later on if they're even if you go out to Hollywood and, and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do if you want to go work work uh on movies at working grinding out not making a ton of money making connections the whole thing or if you want to stay in whatever community you're in and work at like be the digital media producer for like the car dealership or the law firm or what or maybe that's that's not a good example of law firm but like um you end up working and you're like making rich people richer and you're like what am i doing like what am i doing with my life like i'm you know i i can't give any specific examples for, for my personal <laughs> life but i know i've worked for people that i'm like why like i'm selling my soul when i'm creating this video for you and like you don't care about me at all and the 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 story that i'm creating does nothing but like make you look good and feel good and make you more money. And so like for me and other people I'm friends with, and I've seen go through this path, we, a lot of us end up gravitating towards nonprofit work because it's like, I can use my craft, my skill to make a difference. And the fact that you didn't like consciously do that, I don't know. Like, I think you actually like skip kind of that step of having to work for like the, the man, you know, before realizing like my, my skill sets are like super valuable and can make a difference. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. I do think I worked for the man though. When I did depositions, I was basically looking, working for law firms every day and I was working for the man there for sure. I was like filming depositions. So, mm. but thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's been very rewarding working for a nonprofit that helps kids in Chicago and just I feel like this is the first job where I don't feel like I'm hovered over and I feel like I can be very creative and my coworkers trust me and I feel like my voice is heard and I can, that's awesome. yeah. And I just feel like that's, yeah, it's just a good feeling knowing that I'm trusted in the, the work that I do. And I haven't had that in every job I've done. So tell me about Obliterate. Okay. Um, so it's my side hustle project. My podcast is Blittery Podcast. Um, I basically just interview people about an ex-partner, an ex-friend, an ex-family member that was really important in their life at one point who they don't talk to anymore. Um, and yeah. <laughs> so how'd you get into, was it, did you start listening to podcasts? Like how did that a lot of people, it's a big leap to go, just go, I'm going to start a podcast about people I used to have a relationship with. I mean, what, what were the steps that kind of got you to that point? 
So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been listening to podcasts for a couple of years now, mostly murder mystery podcasts. Love all those. But um, I went through, I wouldn't say traumatic breakup, but I went through a breakup a few years ago with a man that I was with for four years. Um, and I thought I was going to like marry him. I thought that he was the one, all that stuff. And we broke up kind of suddenly and I'm never going to talk to him again. And that's not that I talk to all my exes at all, but I feel like with most of them, I know what they're doing. I I'm like still friends with them on social. I'm still, some way connected to them and this man he completely like blocked me I don't have his number anymore like I he lives in New York now and I found out that he moved there like the day before I started my podcast or the day before I thought of the idea of starting my podcast and it just it really weirded me out knowing that I was never going to talk to this person again it just felt strange that someone was such a big part of my life for four years and I don't think I'll ever talk to me and I won't know if he's dead I don't I have no idea like what what's happening with him um and it made me realize that a lot of people have been through that and it just seemed like a good idea for a podcast and I just kind of went from there and asked like friends and family at first and then I joined a lot of podcasting like Facebook groups and realized that a lot of people have stories to tell and yeah what are some of the things you've learned from your guests um, I think the main thing I've learned is look for your, look out for yourself first before looking out for your partner and figure out what you want before entering in a long-term relationship. Because a lot of people that are in relationships care way more about what their partner thinks than what they think. And that causes a lot of turmoil and a lot of divorces end up because of that. And I feel like when I interviewed you, that was even like a a thing with you was you were with someone that didn't want the same things as you, but you still loved them and wanted to be with them because of that. But if you don't want the same things, it's never going to work. Um, I feel like just knowing yourself before being with someone is really important. Um, yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's another thing that you do where you're really like, helping people and like for me it was very cathartic because i am really good at compartmentalizing and just staying busy making podcasts (laughs) so i don't have to think about all the icky bad feelings inside (laughs) and so when i was talking with you it's like i was kind of forced to confront some stuff and uh i felt way better afterwards and like i don't care if the episode sucks (laughs) and that's the other thing about like my podcast was like if nobody listens, like, I don't care. Cause I get to talk to my old friend, Christine for an hour. And it's like a good excuse to just like pick your brain and see, like, see your world through my lens kind of thing. So yeah, you know, I love it. I, I'm definitely a storyteller. I want to be doing more stuff like what you've done throughout your career and just like helping people. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I yeah. feel like with the podcasting world, one thing that Jared, my boyfriend, is keeps telling me is because I feel like there's a big part of me that's like, I want this to blow up. I want th- I want to be famous. And he's like, you can't think of things that way. Like, are you enjoying doing this still? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, then just go with that. And don't worry about the views. Don't worry about it blowing up, because if it's supposed to, it will kind of a thing. Um, yeah, but I do want to be famous. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't we all? Let's talk about our time on David Letterman. Sounds good. Okay. Were you in your senior year of college? Or I was my senior oh. year. So that was your last semester? Mm-hmm. Okay. I was my, that was my junior year. It was the first semester of 2012. I had been to New York City one time, uh, one time to visit and then one time to interview. And I just rode the train and interviewed and rode the train home. Uh, even though I'm from New York, I had only been there twice and then I moved there uh, for five months and you moved there from Chicago. Uh, How did you find out about the internship? How did you get the internship? Uh, And uh, what are your overall thoughts on the internship? So I feel like I was just randomly looking up internships that are famous online with my roommate at the time. 
like just internships in TV. And I stumbled upon the Letterman one. It, it wasn't even through Ball State. It was just randomly through Letterman's website or CBS's website or something. Because it was on CBS, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so me and my roommate both applied the same night because he was also a TCOP major. And we both got an interview a week later. <laughs> and so we were both freaking out. Um, and we ended up driving to New York together. And um, I had been to New York once before I went with it on a band trip in high school which was fun but, but yeah I remember just we stayed with my roommate's friend who was living in New York at the time and I just remember my interview after was so nasty and like <laughs> I was wearing these like really big billy billowy pants with this like white shirt and just, um but I feel like it was such a long interview it was like eight hours there was what I remember department. yeah yeah and it was like so stressful and nerve-wracking um but we made the, the long drive there and back and I heard nothing and for like the next two months and my roommate got offered it before me and got offered the position he did not not mine but like a different position and he, wow. ended, up, he ended up taking it because he had an internship that fall in LA and he was like I need to save money I can't oh wow I could be interviewing him right now you could but um he didn't I think he got offered a different role though it wasn't my role but someone else got offered my role before me because they told me two weeks before I had to move to New York that I got it so I knew that I knew that I wasn't the first pick because I was supposed to find out like a month before that but I found out in my Kia Soul driving to my boyfriend at the time's like apartment in college. And I remember being like, can I, can I think about it? <laughs> Cause I, I didn't know like money wise, if I could afford it and all that stuff. And my parents were like, were convinced I wasn't going to get it because it was such like an intense internship. Um, and so I called them right away and they were like, yes, take it. And I remember telling my boyfriend, he was like, how are we going to do long distance? <laughs> <laughs> David, oh, I'll beat that out. <laughs> Thinking about that now, it's like who cares? I remember like being like, "Oh no!" And it's like I should have broken up with him like that day, <laughs> like bye. But that's what uh, I did. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> really? I had a girlfriend too, and she didn't want me to go, so I'm like, "I'm going." <laughs> oh my god, good mm-hmm. for you! Yeah, he didn't want me to go either, but I took it. And my parents helped me find housing where I lived in like that weird dorm (laughs) with Alicia (laughs) and they drove me there. And I remember bringing like way too much stuff. It was like disgusting how much stuff I brought, like five crates of things, mostly all ugly clothes. (laughs) Um, But yeah, they dropped me off. I remember they bought me an iPhone for the first time that they were like, you need a smartphone. Um, And the first day that I was there, I had to go on a run to that, like, weird tv like video store and i got lost and like freaked out and called my parents and they were like we don't know new york use your new fancy iphone to get home (laughs) and ended up calling my roommate alicia and she like met me and like took the train with me back but it was the best experience it really was it (laughs) It really was i i had just turned i mean i had turned 21 like a week prior to yeah so it was like first time moving away from home just 21 newly single like in new york city the center of the world hi king louis you don't mean to get rid of him no he's fine okay um so yeah it was great and then um yeah but i thought they had i was under the impression that it was a highly exclusive internship but apparently they're just handing out offers left and right <laughs> i mean i think i feel like w- they probably pick people from Ball State specifically because sure. Letterman went there. Um, and I, I am like, for sure, I feel like I was a second or third pick because of the way that I was asked. And I, I don't even think that that was like one of my top choices with that was that position. It was like no. the writers. Yeah. The writers intern. They yeah. did. They do that. I found out. Well, I, I don't know. This is hearsay, but I guess what they did was if you wanted to be a writer, they put you in talent if you wanted to be if you wanted to be meeting celebrities they put you in writing and so like i had no interest they don't they didn't want people trying to submit jokes 
They didn't okay. want, yeah, you know, or they didn't want people that just were there to meet celebrities. Interesting. So they, they kind of like find out what you want to do. And then they're like, we like you, but we're going to put you in it. And shout out Don, Don Farina. She's the one that got me the internship. Uh, Christine and I were both on the 14th floor of the Ed Sullivan theater working for <laughs> the writing staff, the Stango brothers, Paul Masella. I actually don't really talk to a lot of people about this very often because either the kids don't know who Letterman is, which is crazy. <laughs> the kids. <laughs> the, the youths, uh, the, 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 the next generation. Are you feeling the generation gap at all? Or are you like just still I'm really starting in touch? to. Yeah. But I feel like since I work in social, it's not as bad. I'm definitely way cooler than a lot of my friends. <laughs> but there are things that I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah, so we worked on the 14th floor. We got to, basically, we would just work four days a week. Did we, we didn't work on Fridays, right? five days a week. Oh, it was half day on Friday. We didn't take yeah, on half Friday. Day. Yeah, and then we had, like, all the steak and shake we wanted. <laughs> all the steak and shake, and then all the, um, Will Farrell had a case of beer dropped off, so we would, like, go to the mail room and load up uh, Old yep. Milwaukee, backpacks of that, and then... We would ride the train down to Coney Island. I remember doing that one time. Or that was that one day in February in New York City when we went to the castle and it was like 80 degrees outside. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. And then I met a guy on the subway named Derek. <laughs> subway Derek. And he called me a couple of weeks ago just to catch up. Oh. Yeah. And I hadn't talked to him in like wedding? four years. Yeah, I went to his wedding. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in Kansas. So, so yeah, it was just like a really cool opportunity to meet people. And so I, I think I still owe my parents money. Like, they're not basically trying to collect. But, um, but I feel like someday I, I'm going to, like, just write them a check and be like, here's for Letterman, you know, Aww. like. 20 years ago you talking about how you were like, I owe them so much. Uh -huh. <laughs> I do think we had the best positions though. Like I feel like, especially I me mean, not to, I just, I was in a writer's room every day, just sitting there on like a weird computer in the corner. And I feel like I should have taken more advantage of just listening, but I, I always felt awkward, like watching what they were doing. So I was acted like I was busy. I know it was kind of like walking on for me, especially it was like kind of walking on eggshells um, because I didn't know what kind of moods, what kind of mood the Stangles would be in. And um, so it's like, should I pay more attention? Should I pay less attention? And also for me, it was very humbling because like getting the Letterman internship was a big deal at my college. So it's like, he's going off to New York, the big, the big apple. <laughs> big city <laughs> big city and uh so i was like ah oh, you know like i'm a big hot shot whatever and then you get there and like no one gives a shit at all no one cares yeah. whatsoever because <laughs> you're like you're like the like after you leave the internship you become a page then you work in the mail room and this is like this is like this at um uh, nbc this is like at conan any of them, you know, even out in Hollywood too, where they're doing, I think Colbert's, yeah, Colbert's and Ed Sullivan now. You become a page, then you work in the mail room, then you become a receptionist, then you become an assistant. Then like when you're 35, you could like maybe have like an associate role kind of yeah. thing because it's so competitive. So that was like, for me, I was like, okay, maybe I don't want to do that. And maybe I'm not as, as fantastic as I think I am. <laughs> So, I didn't get a page job. I applied, didn't get it. So uh, I mean, someone, that stuff's hard. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but I also, it's cool. Cause I'll watch Netflix and I'll see like Jenna Friedman's name. And it's like, Oh yeah. I said, she loves sushi. <laughs> yeah. She was on, uh, she was on the Palm Springs movie on Hulu recently. I didn't see that one, but okay. um, some of the other um, Jerry Foley directed a movie. And um, the CEO of Worldwide Pants, I can't remember his name. Can't either. Yeah, he uh, he had a movie too with Paul Rudd. But oh, that's cool. I just kind of keep up and see what everyone's doing, but I don't really talk to anyone. Um, you know what the Stangles are doing? They were uh, they were doing a, a show with Harry Connick Jr., but I don't oh, know now. I have no idea. Yeah, he had a talk show, I guess, and they were writing for him. 
So, but it was, yeah, it was cool. It was like really for me, a very humbling. I've had many humbling moments in my life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So like, are there other people that are in similar that either went to school with you or, um, or you met in your career that got there a different way or decided to go a different route? Like what's some advice you could give to baby Christine or baby Tyler? Like when you're 17, 18 to, to just kind of like steer you along and uh, help discover what you want to do kind of thing. I mean, there's definitely people in college that are in the industry that like took different paths. Like one of my best friends, Joe, he got his master's at Ball State and now is like a really, really successful DP and like freelances everywhere. And he's killing it. He, yeah, he is always on a job DPing. And I think he like bought a red camera, like right out of his master's program, like leased it or something. Um, And now he has like all the equipment and just, yeah, he's killing it. And I have like other friends that are out in LA that are doing like things, but I guess the advice I would give myself is to just take all the risks. Um, not that I haven't enjoyed my life cause I have, and I'm happy that I'm doing what I'm doing now. But I think if I wanted to be doing like movies, I should have moved to New York or LA immediately after college. But yeah, sorry, I'm going to charge my computer. I thought it was charging. No, you're good. Um, Let's see. How do you want to expand and grow your skills this year? Um, Well, I'm taking a voice acting class, which is exciting. With the voice actor studio in Las Vegas. I'm doing it remotely. Um, Mercy Home's actually like paying for that for me. They're really good about um, professional development. Um. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing that as like a side hustle, just like looking more into voice acting. Um, I want to keep working on my podcast, keep growing it and possibly getting like advertisers for it eventually. Um, I would love to write a script, (laughs) especially about that weird job I was talking about, evidence video where I filmed um, people dying. I think it'd be a really interesting movie. Um, and just like continuing to help Mercy Home, I think would be great. Just getting a raise, growing their like presence in Chicago and helping their marketing efforts. Those are my main goals for 2021. <laughs> Heck yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so do you, uh, want to take a minute to plug the, plug the podcast and how can people find you and learn more about what you do and to take a listen? Sure. Um, so yeah, you can find a Blue Rate podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, all that stuff. Um, you can ask your Alexa, you can ask your Google Home, all, the, all those things. Um, please subscribe and comment and share and listen if you have any interest. Um, I also have a website where you can view all of my videos that I've done, www.christinenicolich.com. Um, yeah, all of my work's on there. My podcasts are on there. Um, but yeah, you can find me on social, um, literary podcast, Instagram or CG Nicholas Instagram as well. I did get a TikTok for a literary podcast. It's doing okay. <laughs> really? Yeah. I'll have to it's doing just okay. <laughs> I have an account, but I don't. Yeah. Not into it yet. No. I mean, I feel like that's one of the things that's kind of like, I'm like, uh, it's too new yeah. for me. <laughs> it's pretty addicting, but yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> I have one, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you want to, do you have any other little last, uh, comments before we close out? Um, I think just in general, I mean, if you want, if you're looking to do more corporate videography, there's so much stuff you could do. And if you, majored in film it doesn't mean you have to be a big movie magic star you can still find jobs in your hometown or in like smaller cities like seattle chicago and everyone's looking for a videographer and a production person like every company wants that especially Um, now when people can't do in person yeah exactly so 
I think there's different ways to find that job and to make that career your own. And it doesn't have to just be working in Hollywood. <laughs> Even though we, we tried it or we did it for a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to other artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. If you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening, please leave us a good review on your favorite podcast platform. You can send suggestions for guests and episode feedback to wecreatetruth at gmail.com, or you can find us on the web at creative-truth.com to learn more. Thanks for coming on. Of course. Thanks for having me.